Thanks be to God for the gift of music. Our second scripture reading comes from the Gospel of Mark, chapter 8, verses 27 to 37. Listen for the word of God. Jesus went on with his disciples to the villages of Caesarea Philippi, and on the way he asked his disciples, Who do people say that I am? And they answered him, John the Baptist, and others, Elijah, and still others, one of the prophets. He asked them, But who do you say that I am? Peter answered him, You are the Messiah. And he sternly ordered them not to tell anyone about him. Then he began to teach them that the Son of Man must undergo great suffering and be rejected by the elders and the chief priests and the scribes and be killed. And on the third and three days rise again. He said all this quite openly, and Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. But turning and looking at the disciples, he rebuked Peter, saying, Get behind me, Satan, for you are setting your mind not on divine things, but on human things. He called the crowd with his disciples and said to them, If any want to become my followers, let them deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. For those who want to save their life will lose it. And those who lose their lives for my sake and for the sake of the gospel will save it. For what will it profit them to gain the whole world and yet forfeit their life? Indeed, what can they give in return for their life? This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. This weekend, I got to spend time with one of my best friends, and all week last week, I found myself getting so excited that I couldn't focus very well. I just wanted to envision what the weekend would be like being with my dear friend. I had built up my expectations. And we do that sometimes, right? Maybe for a wedding, you get so planned and excited so that the night before, it's hard to sleep for all that is coming the next day. Or with um, maybe a move, you say goodbye to all that is familiar and then open your life, yourself, to new places and new people. Or maybe you've been excited about a graduation day or a party, and you just can't wait for those moments of togetherness and celebration. All of this expectation and planning can carry us on the wings of life's possibility. Life can be so rich and meaningful that we soar with expectation. But sometimes, when we soar on the wings of expectation, it can carry us into its own world, where at times expectation diverges from reality. The movie of 500 Days of Summer has a great scene that illustrates this reality versus expectations situation. The main character, Tom, goes to a party in hopes of winning back his ex-girlfriend, Summer. The scene is set up with two films playing side by side. On the bottom of one half of the film, it says expectations. And on the bottom of the other, reality. As Tom walks up to Summer's door, birthday gift in hand, both screens are the exact same. But as soon as she opens the door, the expectation side and the reality side diverge. The expectation side shows Summer and Tom reconnecting and spending the time of the party in a corner catching up. The reality side shows Tom sitting alone, making small talk with strangers. You can imagine how heart-wrenching it is to watch the two scenes play out side by side as anticipation is met with disappointment. Now, in our story for the Gospel of Mark today, Peter is having an expectations versus reality experience. And because the Gospel of Mark is written with such pace and incredible cinematic mindfulness, each scene cutting into the next, it's fitting to retell the story through the dual films of Peter's expectations and reality. 
So imagine it with me. Expectations on the left and reality on the right, both scenes are identical as Jesus and his disciples set out walking. They've left the Jewish crowds behind. They're in between the place that they have left and the place that they are going. And it's on this in-between road that Jesus asks his disciples the question, who do people say that I am? The disciples have been among the crowds hearing various people make sense of this miracle-working, Pharisee-defying, demon-casting man. Surely the disciples have a read on the gossip, and they do. The disciples report what they've heard. First, someone says, Herod himself thinks you're John the Baptist, resurrected from the dead, come back to haunt him. Immediately, one adds, the people aren't all the same, though. Others think you are Elijah. They think you are here to say that God is coming very soon to judge between those who fear the Lord and those who don't. But still, a third opinion arises when someone adds, still others say that you're a prophet in the line of Moses. Your signs show that you speak for the Lord. Notice that all the ways the people try to understand who Jesus is is through the lens of people who have come before, Moses, John, Elijah. But the question that comes next was originally posed to the disciples, but it echoes through millennia to each one of us. But who do you say that I am? Peter responds quickly. He says, you are the Messiah. The Greek word is Christos, meaning literally the anointed one, the long-awaited Christ. I've always imagined the brisk walking of the group stopping dead right there as, as he says, you are the Messiah. This is the first time anyone has used that word in the Gospel of Mark to describe Jesus. And we hear that word all the time, Christ. Whenever we say our religion, we are Christians, Christians, or we say we're trying to follow Christ. We practically use Christ as Jesus' last name. But what Messiah really means is where the expectations side of the screen and the reality side begin to diverge. From his confession that Jesus is the Messiah, Peter's expectations take flight. All the historical and biblical evidence I can gather leads me to think Peter's expectations film would look something like this. Jesus responds by saying, yes, Peter, I am the anointed one in the line of the great King David. I am the culmination of the Jewish people's hope. I am king over the Jews, and I am against the Romans. The time has come for me to reign. Go out and tell everyone. Instruct them to grab their weapons, because we are going to overthrow the Romans. We are going to restore Israel's independence, free the Jewish people, and be righteous before God. So from this little road in between two towns, a revolt would gain momentum. Jesus would lead a battle to a victorious end, reminiscent of the days of Joshua, where God overcame great odds for the sake of the Israelite people. All the miracles Jesus had done up until this point would just have been simple preparation for this big battle miracle. For Peter, not only would he have been a key part in this renewed independence, but he and his people would finally live in relative peace. No more Roman taxation leaving them poor. No more Roman soldiers calling Jewish people backwards and stupid. No, the Jewish people would finally live in security, safe from outside threats. They would have the power to govern themselves and determine their future. And best of all, their status as a people and as individuals would be solidified in the history books. Now, I'm not a biblical author, but you get the picture. For Peter, the expectations side of the screen means that Messiah would mean independence, security, 
and power. So hold those hopes in your heart as we watch the reality film play out next to it. Jesus instructs his disciples to tell no one that he is the anointed king. He will maintain this insistence on silence even after the transfiguration where Moses and Elijah show up to talk with him. Then, while he begins walking again on this path, he openly and very calmly tells the disciples that instead of leading a victorious revolt, he must undergo great suffering. Instead of bringing all of the Jewish people together, the religious and political leaders, the elders, the chief priests, and the scribes are going to reject him. And then his messiahship will culminate in death, and he will be raised again three days later. The messiah must suffer, accept rejection, and die. What a letdown for Peter. I think Peter was so enthralled with his own expectations about what Messiah would mean that he avoids what Jesus has said altogether. And instead, he takes Jesus aside and begins rebuking him, rebuking him like Jesus would rebuke a demon to cast it out. Peter would rather believe that Jesus has a demon and needs exorcism than accept what he has said. And while exorcism does seem a bit extreme, who wouldn't resist suffering and rejection and death? The fact that resistance to pain and death is near universal, at least in our culture, makes Jesus' next words a bit odd, a bit severe. Get behind me, Satan. So what does he mean? First of all, the word Satan comes from the Hebrew word Satan, which simply means accuser. In the book of Job, the Satan is present in the heavenly court, and instead of functioning as the supreme overlord of evil, Satan functions more as an adversarial questioner, kind of like a prosecutor. Then in the Gospel of Mark, the concept of Satan shifts from questioner to chief distractor. Early in the gospel, Satan tempts Jesus with security, status, and power. Now, Jesus predicts his future will contain the exact opposite of those temptations. Instead of security, suffering. Instead of high status, rejection. And instead of power, death. Peter is just trying to pull Jesus off course and suddenly becomes the chief distractor and tempter. Hence, Jesus says, get behind me, Satan. Don't tempt me anymore. Jesus is not only disappointing Peter's expectations, but now is turning them all completely on their head. In fact, the entire Gospel of Mark turns on its head at this point in the book. This story comes in chapter 8 of 16. That is halfway through. Up until now, Jesus' ministry has been a blitz of miracles, exorcisms, healings, feeding of the multitudes, all events that fit pretty well in line with Peter's expectations of a powerful Messiah king. But from here on out, the long-awaited Messiah Jesus will be moving toward his death. After this story, Jesus only does two more miracles and instead is constantly teaching and walking toward Jerusalem where he knows he will die. His fame will only be in the form of the suffering servant. His strength will only be in the weakness of his body as he gives up his spirit. His kingship will not mean power over other nations. His coronation will be the cross. And yet, it is by his humiliation that Jesus humiliates those who are trying to seek power. By his servanthood, Jesus raises up the lowly. 
By his death and resurrection, Jesus kills the power of death. That's why we can sing, where, O death, is your victory? Where is your sting? Jesus is indeed the Messiah Christ, but he is the Christ who overturns human expectations and instead reveals the true fabric of reality. And we, as those called by the name of Christ, are invited to live not according to the expectations of the world, but instead according to the reality of God that we see in Jesus Christ. As Christ followers, that is one reality where we remember our mortality and entrust our lives to God, come what may. It's where our acute awareness of suffering leads to compassion and to action, come what may. It's where we lay down our ego and pride and finally say that long-awaited apology, come what may. Because as Christ followers, we too value loving God and loving neighbor more highly than status or security or power. Taking up our crosses doesn't mean accepting mistreatment or oppression. It doesn't mean quiet, suffering submission to the powers that be, whether they be intimate or distant. But instead, it means participation in the victory of Christ over those powers. It means taking Christ's account of reality more seriously than Caesar's or Peter's. Because ultimately, the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus are evidence of God's remarkable determination not to leave us to our own devices or expectations, but instead to invite us into the reality of what Christ's life means for each one of us, that servanthood, vulnerability, and yes, even death can lead to life and life abundantly.